All right, gentlemen. Well, uh, to all of our listeners uh, who've been tuning into our podcast or for folks who uh, are new to it, uh, my name is Tarek and this is Untapped. And it's an opportunity where we have untapped conversations uh, about untapped talent uh, in our industry uh, as we continue to do our work at Canvas. Uh, if you've listened before, or you've been following along, we've chatted with just about everyone. We've chatted with some candidates who've been looking for opportunity in the space. We've chatted with recruiters who are just getting started uh, on their talent journey, on their DNI journey. We've, we've chatted with heads of DNI and, and, and advocates and everything else in between. Uh, but today is a special episode because today we get to hear from two of Canvas's board members, uh, Mike Renal and John Dershin. Um, two people who I've gotten to know over the last nine months uh, in my time at Canvas, but also folks who have just been incredible mentors to the team uh, and to the, uh, the broader company. So let me just say first, welcome, gentlemen. It's good to have you. It's good to be here. Hey. Yeah, thank you for having us. Um, and so we, we usually start off these episodes um, asking people kind of how they got started in their work. And I remember when I first started my career, especially in tech, you would always hear about the board and it's like, you know, the, the Paul Revere, like the board is coming, the board meeting is coming. You'd always hear about these folks, but you never quite get the chance to meet them. And so uh, for this episode, I really just want to help folks understand who you folks are. And I want to kick it off by asking you kind of how you got started in your career to, to, up to this point. Uh, you both have two very different journeys, two very different stories. Um, and so I'll start with you, John. Uh, as someone who's newer to the Canvas board and just help folks understand kind of like how you got here today, right? Uh, from LinkedIn to what you're doing now to your work with your foundation. What do you do? Who are you? Yeah, uh, I ask myself that every day, Tarek. Um, <laughs> no, seriously, though, I, you know, I guess I started uh, as a kid, just kind of really interested in technology. And I was really fortunate to be able to learn how to code when I was younger. I had some awesome mm. teachers. Actually, my third grade teacher taught me how to code. And it was something that I just kind of fell in love with and kept doing. And it was natural as I was applying to college that I would study computer science. So I did that. I went to grad school. And kind of along the way, I was always really interested in, in the impact of technology, and how it can change the world, how it can make things better. And uh, I got really excited about the idea of starting a business and, and creating some of that impact for myself. And so here and there, I would try to start companies and come up with ideas for companies, et cetera. And, you know, I remember I was in grad school and the iPhone app store was uh, announced that it was going to launch in like a year or something. And, yeah. You know, I was out, uh, out at a party with a couple of buddies of mine and, you know, we had a couple of beers and we we're walking back to our dorms and we're like, you know, this is, this is a special moment. This is really mm -hmm. interesting. We got to do something about this. And so that was probably the first time that I really took a swing at doing something entrepreneurial. Mm -hmm. And uh, we decided to kind of drop out of school for a little while and mm -hmm. see if we could build some mobile apps. We built two of the first 500 mobile apps on the iPhone mm -hmm. app store and you know, spent some time doing that. Got a few, a few million users, had a ton of fun, learned a lot, um, and you know, just definitely felt like something I was going to do again and again. Mm -hmm. uh, so after that experience, I went to Google for a little while and I left and I started another company, this time in the recruiting technology space. Mm -hmm. And that company was called Connectifier. We kind of started competing with LinkedIn. At some point, LinkedIn uh, decided they'd rather be on our team and so competing with us. And so they acquired the company, which was a fantastic outcome for all of us. I became the vice president of talent solutions at LinkedIn, mm -hmm. which kind of oversees all of the recruiting technology products, so about 10 or 12 different product lines. Mm -hmm. And uh, along the way, you know, I noticed that there were some severe problems with the way recruiting was happening, you know, in, in a lot of different areas, but a key one was diversity. You know, something that companies were talking about quite a bit even years ago and just really didn't have strong answers to. There was not a lot that they felt that they could do proactively. And I had built a couple of uh, diversity recruiting features at my company, Connectifier, and LinkedIn had not yet made that move. And so I decided. It was really up to me to start putting together a program around all of these diversity recruiting features that we could build out at LinkedIn. 
And as I left uh, LinkedIn uh, sometime later, a few years later, I you know decided that it was still very much an unsolved problem. I wanted to be involved in it still, I wanted to help out still, and uh, you know I ended up having some conversations with Ben, who's obviously mm-hmm. the CEO at Canvas, and uh, felt like it was a really good fit for me to come on on the board and uh, kind of do some things with you guys. Mm. JJ, got it. Um, all right, Mike, a different story, story, right? All together. Um, and probably met Ben and the company in a different way as well. Uh, and really was the jumpstart to Canvas in so many ways, right? So bring us to your journey as well. Um, help us understand uh, not only where you've been, but what brought you here. Yeah, definitely. Uh, well, first, uh, once again, thank you for having me. Um, so let's see. I um, actually probably had a... a a similar start to John in some ways. I um, let's see. I, I grew up. I grew up as the youngest of four kids, uh, just outside of New York, and we, uh, you know, we grew up in a small apartment. We didn't. I. I. I I've been very fortunate, but uh, we, we grew up in a sort of small apartment. And uh, one thing that my father decided to spur John at some point, probably when I was seven or eight or nine or something like that was uh, was a computer. Uh, I think it was like a 386, uh, a 386DX, I think. Uh, and I was pretty, uh, uh, I was pretty captivated from it, uh, by it from uh, pretty early days. Uh, I didn't, uh, I didn't actually learn how to program it until probably uh, seven or eight years later, but I, I learned how to play computer games on it and that was, that was almost as good. Um, but it was, it was a very fun device. Um, I, uh, you know, I was lucky enough after that uh, to, uh, I went to college, so I went to college, I went to Harvard for undergrad, and I, uh, I thought I was going to be a math major, and I was, I was just kind of doing some, like, web programming stuff on the side uh, to, to, to make some money, um, but I discovered I was not at, as good at math as I thought I was, but I was, I was better with computers, uh, and so uh, I became a computer science major. Um, after college, I, um, uh, um, I, I graduated in sort of 2001, 2002. Uh, so at the very beginning of my senior year in college, September 11th happened, which was one, a pretty traumatic experience, um, for, for everyone. Uh, but certainly sort of coming from New York. And then two, it, it, uh, it caused a huge sort of cratering of the economy. It, it also happened to coincide with a little bit of the, um, the implosion of the dot-com bubble back then. Uh, and so, after um, after my senior year of college, I, I moved out to the West Coast and I uh, became a PM at Microsoft. Um, that was kind of my my very first job. Um, I, I learned a lot. Uh, I learned a ton there on just how to um, how to build software, what it was like to work with um, uh, sort of really great people from uh, uh, from all over. Uh, so I spent I spent five or six years there working both as a PM and engineer. Um, and then after that, I, uh, I had a bunch of friends from, from my time in college that had gone to Facebook very early on. Um, and they had sort of, uh, they had suggested that I join at some point. And so, uh, uh again, I, I was fortunate I, to join Facebook when it was, uh, still relatively small, a few hundred people. Um, and I was there for about eight and a half years, uh, I worked on a bunch of different sort of engineering and product related things. Um, probably for about the my last few years there, I was um, I was supporting an org of probably you know a few hundred PMs and engineers and designers and the like. Um, and then I ended up at Sequoia, where I've been for a, about the past five years, uh, and uh, fortunate enough to work with you guys uh, at Canvas for the past couple of years of that. Um, and I think there's, I, I would say there is, there are a couple of things that uh, sort of really uh, sort of excited me about Canvas. First, one of the things that, um, I think one of the things that we look for in founders generally is just uh, sort of like some blend of authenticity, resilience, and grit. Uh I think there is there's a lot of folks out there that um, kind of want to start a company because it is kind of an in vogue thing to do, um, but I think 
the many of the most impactful founders are almost reluctant founders, uh, where there's kind of this this burning problem in the world that they want to go solve, and the only way to go solve it is to sort of create a company and marshal, you know, marshal a movement to 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 go make it happen. Um, and uh, uh, I thought Ben just had a very authentic story and had a lot of resilience uh, and a lot of grit around uh, wanting to change the way that um, uh, the talent industry worked, how people were hired, what they were judged on, et cetera. Um, and then I, um, I was just, I was a big believer in the cause and I think what we were trying to do. Uh, there is this saying that, uh, I've heard from a bunch of places, I think someone that uh, I used to know who unfortunately passed away recently used to say it quite a bit, which is uh, talent is uniformly distributed, opportunity is not. And uh, I think that that holds true geographically and in other ways as well. Um, and uh, I, I, I really liked the way that uh, in the early days, Jumpstart was kind of trying to level the playing field a little bit. Uh, geographically, and now in a post, as we move to a post-COVID world, and more and more companies are remote first, I think uh, there is a lot of opportunity to um, make opportunity as uniformly distributed as talented. Boom! Yeah, Ben is it, he has a lot of things, but uh, grit is certainly what he leads with, and so he definitely has that. And uh, for folks who are listening and haven't met Ben, once you do, you understand exactly what we're talking about. Um, all right. So you both mentioned something that I think it's worth touching on before we go a little bit deeper into your journeys. And that's this idea of diversity, right? Inclusion, opportunity in Silicon Valley. Uh, you folks have been around the block a minute, right? Um, and has seen the industry change over time. And I think that year over year, even when I was in C as a DNI leader, you would see, kind of see the same movie play over again, right? Something would happen at some company. They would, you know, release a diversity report. They'd make a bunch of commitments. Then the rest of the folks who were kind of in that place or in a similar position would do the same. And uh, as a result of that, then you see all of the media outlets, all of the social enterprises, a number of the nonprofits say, okay, this is great, but tech still hasn't come far enough, right? And so uh, in my view, this last year feels a little different. It feels like in a post-COVID world, it feels different. It feels like with more companies, you know, moving to a more distributed workforce feels a little bit different. It feels like coupled with a, a growing racial justice movement and gender justice movement, it just feels like a different point in time than probably previous years. Uh, do you agree? Do you feel like it feels different? Does it feel like the same thing? Kind of as you reflect on your broader journey in being um, not only a part of companies who've made strides in DNI, but caring a lot about DNI, uh, what makes this moment in 2021 different than maybe what you've seen in the past? And either of you can take it first. Mike, you want to take a crack at that first and your follow sure. up? Sure. Um, I, I think, look, uh, uh, I think we have probably made progress over the past year. I think there's clearly still way more uh, progress, way more distance to travel than the distance already traveled. Um, but I, I think you're right. I think there are a few things that play into it in particular. One is, um, I, I think it's a confluence of factors. Uh, I think one is, if, if you think about just the start of Jumpstart and, and, and where we started out, like a, a lot of the reason, um, a lot of how I thought about the business in, in the, the very beginning was th the way college recruiting historically worked was you would go to, you, you could only really afford as a company to go to eight or 10 schools um, because you had to physically visit them. Um, you had to... Hope, go to a career fair, you had to have a booth, you had to do all these different things. And so the easiest thing to do, if you're a Google or a Microsoft or a Facebook, the easiest thing to do is to probably go to the top eight or 10 schools. Uh, or if you're a, sort of a more regional player, maybe you go to the regional schools in your area. But you're not, there's no way you can touch all two or 3,000 colleges in the US because it was, it was fundamentally an on the ground game. Um, and so I think just looking at that sort of the early career market, uh, clearly one of the, you know, uh, the world quickly moved to a fully virtual environment. Uh, and I think it became a lot easier to really engage with uh, early career folks everywhere and not just in those top eight or 10 schools. Uh, so I think, you know, that that was one, uh, one change. Two, I think the, um, obviously with the 
dramatic fast dramatically fast shift to remote work uh and i think the the fact that many companies are going to stay remote first after this uh i think the ability to recruit from all over both all over the us and all over the world changed dramatically you can see there you know some of the fastest growing companies in the past year um have been companies that make it easier to sort of hire people and bring people on in other countries like remote.com and others and so the i think the fact now that you can really draw from talent all over the world i think is another huge driver uh and then to your point i, I think the uh i think there is a lot of realization uh there is there is the continued path of realization over the past year um of um uh, of some of the sort of the social issues that are still rife in society. And I think that has just made it uh, more top of mind and acute for a lot of people. So there you go. Thanks, Mike. What about you, John? Yeah, to add on to what Mike said, I mean, I think everything he said was spot on. There are a couple of, of interesting trends I think are worth thinking about. And he mentioned both of them. One is kind of the increasing importance placed on diversity efforts because of the increasing uh, visibility of the costs of not getting it right. And we've all seen that play out over the last year. We don't need to, to go into that too much. But I think there's another thing that maybe is less visible to everybody, which is another thing that Mike pointed out. And that's that there's a new set of capabilities to do something about these problems that just mm. hasn't really existed before. And you know, I think it's been the case for you know, around a decade or more, that a number of companies, especially in tech, where we operate, but in another number of other industries also, a number of companies have placed diversity among their values at mm. their corporations and and had the right set of intentions, the right set of motivations, but really failed to take that next step. And while they had it as a value, they didn't have a strategy. They didn't have a set of tactics that they could deploy to accomplish something related to diversity. And we're starting to see that change. I'll mention just a couple of things that I've kind of personally been involved with, not because it's the whole picture, just, just because I think it's interesting. At the outset, I think when we started having this conversation in the tech industry, it wasn't even clear what the target should be, right? And I sure. think the media was starting to talk about it as like, you know, there's, there's an underrepresentation problem with women in engineering, for example, among many problems. And they would look at kind of the general population and say, well, you know, general population is about 50-50 men, women. And, you know, there's another group of people who don't identify that way. And we got to make sure that they're represented correctly too. But they're kind of looking at the whole population. And now over just the last few years, we're starting to develop technologies where you can take a deeper look and say, well, you know, in our industry, maybe it's not 50-50. In our industry, for this specific set of skills, it's not 50-50. So while 50-50 might not feel realistic for an individual company because they can't go change, in the, change the schooling system, change who's getting degrees, change who's had jobs like this before and collected the right skills, what they can do is make sure that they're aware of the target that's relevant for the population that they're looking at, for the talent pool that they're looking at, and set targets that are actually achievable. And then start motivating their people to achieve those targets. I think that's like a breakthrough. And, uh, you know, there's a product that I helped uh, launch at LinkedIn called LinkedIn Talent Insights that kind of creates those kinds of breakdowns in the market. And so we've seen, I've seen a lot of companies take advantage of that, start setting realistic targets. The next step is having a set of technologies that let you do something about those targets and actually recruit from certain pools of people you didn't have access to well before. And that's a, a place, obviously, where I think Canvas really shines. I think the kinds of, of technology we've brought to bear in this case is just you know, it's beyond anything that's existed before. And so I think a lot of people have struggled feeling like, you know, we can attach process to this problem. We can add the Rooney rule, et cetera. But where do we have solutions? Where do we have products that we can really utilized to solve this problem in a meaningful way. And I think as those are starting to emerge, that's part of what it makes, makes it feel like we're starting to make more progress now. That's right. I think that's right. And I think that both of you are hitting on this trend that diversity and inclusion and these ideas of belonging and all the buzzwords that you hear that sometimes actually muddy the waters in so many ways are no longer values that are just being 
you know, placed on a wall on a shelf somewhere, but that folks were actually, whether it's employees, you know, through this lens of employee activism, holding folks accountable, it could be a blog post, it could be an internal conversation, you name it. But also, I mean, from the top down, like folks really actually, you know, making an investment and wanting the fabric of their companies to change. And so on that line and on that trend, uh, we've also seen, I think, in the last probably year or so, um, a number of VCs, right, and a number of investors and, and, and board members really calling on their CEOs and their leadership teams to really take diversity seriously. They're not waiting for policy to do it. They're not waiting for state legislators to regulate it or whatever the case may be for publicly traded companies. They're really saying, actually, you need to start early. And you folks even gave us the charge internally of keeping diversity top of mind, even when we were under 30 employees, right? Because we already had a little bit of that diversity debt. So I want to switch gears a little bit and talk about, you know, both of you are board members, not just at Canvas, but in other spaces and places. And I really want to uh, kind of dig into how do you have this conversation with your portfolio companies? Do you take the same approach that you took with us and say, think about this early? Do you point folks in the right direction? Really, how are you thinking about this with uh, the boards that you sit on and with the founders that you work with, knowing that diversity is so top of mind for the world right now? Uh, JJ, let's start with you. Yeah, great. Uh, Mike might go uh, in a slightly different direction. I think uh, his investments usually go a little deeper than mine do. But you know, there's probably mm -hmm. 40, 50 companies that I've invested in or I advise or sit on the board, have some interaction with. And you know, to be honest, it takes a variety of forms. Sometimes that's just a couple of people and an idea. And you know, right. they're usually looking out for survival. They're like, we need a, a check to get this company off the ground and we need to hire our friend that we know well, who we know wants to leave their, their company. And it can be hard in the really early stages when you're a handful of people to be truly representative. And I think it's important to kind of keep that in mind in the very early stages. But it's surprising how quickly I think it becomes really relevant. Because mm. if you're not building out a diverse and inclusive culture, and I've seen this happen before, you can kind of lock yourself into a position where there are certain pools of talent that no longer find your company a really appealing place to work because it's That's right. really homogenous or it doesn't look like the kind of place for someone like them or whatever it is. And it's, it's kind of mind blowing how quickly that can happen. And, and so that's why I think, you know, it's so important to kind of at the outset, even before you're starting to do something about it, even before you set the strategy, it is important to make sure that it's a value that you have pretty much when mm -hmm. you're founding the company. Spot on. What about you, Mike? Yeah, I mean, one of the things I've been impressed by and hardened by over the past couple of years is uh, the degree to which founders are focused on this from the very beginning. Uh, there are uh, you know, as you asked the question, I was thinking about it and I can think of many cases where the founders have said, you know, sub 10 people inside the company, like, uh, we, uh, basically like we're going to pause hiring here. Like we, we, we all, uh, we're all the same. We're going to like pause adding new people here until, um, we can really, uh, take a crack at building a more diverse team. Um, and that the number of times that has come up is actually, as I'm thinking about it right now, is is surprising. And like I said, it's heartening. I, I think f like founders, especially, um, I think especially younger founders, especially founders that for whom this is a real, uh, you know, to your point earlier, it's not a buzzword. It's like a value. I think they really care about this um, and they, they care about it actually not just in terms of the team members, not just in terms of the folks that they hire, but um, they care about it in terms of investors, they care about it in, in terms of angel investors, um, and just sort of having as diverse a group of people around the table as possible. Um, so I think there's a bunch of folks, uh, like I said, who are um, sort of just naturally get it and are paying a lot of attention to this. Um, I, I agree with John as well, like there is, you know, there is a, uh, sort of very, very early stage of a company where it's usually two or three or four people where uh, probably like the the expected value, the default state is the company is going to die. And so the job number one is to sort of get the, the company out of that, uh, that default state. Um, but I, I think usually by the 10 person mark, most founders, at least the founders I work with, this is already a top of mind issue. 
And if it's not, um, it's a, I think it's just, it's, it's a topic to put out on the table because I, I agree with John completely. If you get too far down a certain path, then like if you have too homogenous a team, if you have too large a team that is too homogenous, you will just shut out a bunch of talent pools that don't want to like, you know, don't see themselves in that company, don't see themselves uh, in that group and will just, you know, go take their talents elsewhere. So. Boom. And, and I, I think there's, you know, it, it's interesting, you know, Canvas certainly operates in the diversity space, right? We want to help folks build diverse teams faster than anyone else. We want to give candidates opportunity, especially those who have been left out. But some of the feedback that we've heard um, is that as we have conversations with some of our customers, let's make sure we're keeping culture and inclusion top of mind too. And we've even had these discussions as a team. And in the same way that I think that uh, diversity used to it, it operated in this conversation around, well, it's too early to prioritize that, right? We'll, we'll, we'll pay that down later. We'll hire a DNI leader at 150 employees. Let's just crush it. We're also starting to see the same thing or the same conversations around culture. Well, you know, with the first 10 folks, like, the culture is implicit. There's no need to be explicit, right? There's no need to really invest in some of these cultural milestones just yet. Let's just get things done. And so I know it's a little bit of a deviation, but I do also want to talk about a little bit about culture because you folks have been involved in, you know, the day negative one culture, right? In helping to advise and stand, you know, different organizations up. Um, when is it too early or when is it too late to think about culture or, or when should folks start thinking about making some of these cultural investments earlier rather than later, moving from the implicit to more explicit? I mean, I think the reality is you're starting to make these decisions on day one. You just right. may or may not be prioritizing them, may or may not be doing it consciously. That's the reality. Mm. And I think literally the first time you bring someone on board, you've made a decision about an addition to your culture and what kind of person you want to have join the company. The way that you treat them, the way that you onboard them, the way that you relate to them as a coworker is starting to build your culture. So it's really just a question of, do you want to do this blindly and unconsciously, or do you want to have some control over it? And I think pretty much any sensible founder is going to want to have some control over it and be putting mm. some early thought into it. I think the question is, you know, what are the things that you can do about it as, right. you, as you start making those decisions? How can you start setting the culture the right way? How can you make sure that it is an inclusive culture. And obviously, you know, the culture of the company and, you know, the diversity of the kind of people that you can bring on board to the company are, are closely related, right? And sure. the, the diversity of the kind of people who are going to be successful at that company is closely That's related right. to the culture. And so I think that there's a lot of things that, that I've seen. I'm happy to share a couple of them that I think are really interesting. I'd love to hear that kind of solve this problem in an interesting way. So one is, you know, and you can do these things at the very early stages of the company. One is as you're starting to make offers to people you want to bring on board to the company, a lot of people have this conception that, you know, they want to treat everyone fairly. They want to give everyone the same offer. And that's what equality is. So just give everyone, everyone the same offer. And I think in a lot of cases, actually, that can be a bad fit. I've seen a lot of people that I've tried to hire, a lot of people that other companies have tried to hire who come from a different cultural background and, you know, don't have the same uh, advantages as we had growing up and can't tolerate or can't maybe understand the kind of risk that it might take to join an early stage company. And I've seen right. a lot of companies as a result really successfully do something where they arrange kind of a slate of offers. And if you know somebody is less familiar with the kinds of risks that they might be taking at a startup, or they're less comfortable taking that kind of risk, that doesn't mean that that person can't be a really valid contributor, really valuable contributor. And so you can have kind of a high equity, low salary offer, a sure. high salary, low equity offer, and something in the middle, and just kind of make things work for this person who ultimately might agree with your vision, might have a lot to offer, but isn't in the same place where they can afford to take the same risks as other people. So that's again, right. that's something that you can start doing from day one. Another thing that you can start doing pretty much from day one is stop making assumptions that everyone coming on board has the same knowledge and understanding and background and is going to be able to use the tools that you use without training. I mean, for example, a lot of people just throw Slack into the mix as if everyone's born knowing how to use Slack. But for a lot of people, 
this is the first time they're using that. Actually, when I started my company, Connectifier, um, I did a training on how to use Gmail. And I found that, you know, maybe to some people's surprise, there's a fair number of people that don't know how to use Gmail. That's and right. Don't know how to use it in a way that's the way that you would expect someone to use it in a modern business environment. And so just right. bringing it back to basics and just making sure that you're not making assumptions, you're being as inclusive as possible, you're kind of adjusting what you need to do, what you need to give people to the person who's honestly there to just contribute and, and do what they can. You know, that's, I think, a really important set of decisions that you can make early on. And it's, it's surprising, you know, Mike was talking about the first 10 hires is around when you want to start making some of these decisions. I think there are cases where even in those first 10 hires, and I'm sure Mike, you would agree, there's people with uneven uh, backgrounds, uneven uh, experiences in terms of these tools and, and things like that. And, mm. and I think it's just, it's so important to just go back to basics and, and make sure you're focusing on it that way at the start. That's right. And, and Mike, I want to hear from you too, but I think, I think there's such a key point for our listeners to hear, whether you're an aspiring founder, whether you're, you, you're already working in a firm, but it's this idea of going back to the basics. And I think it's important. And we've even learned our lessons. We heard, we, you know, we, we've heard feedback around, you know, is communicating on Slack in a distributed world inclusive of folks who may be visually impaired, right? And have some different experiences or, you know, for folks, you know, before Zoom and, and, and Google Hangouts, had the, the the background blend right, or if you, you know if you're lucky enough to have a green screen, what could that what kind of bias could that bring up in an interview process? If you you know had your own home office as opposed to living with a bunch of roommates and had to take the call from your bed, these little things that I actually think that we take it you know take for granted um, really have an impact on people's experiences. And so the way in which we communicate, right, the way in which we document, the way in which we host meetings, camera on versus camera off, these are cultural decisions. Not just the pretty values that we put all the time and fluff into, right? But the things that actually could impact someone's experience on day negative one. Uh, so I really appreciate that point, uh, John. Mike, what about you? Culture. Um, yeah, I. Um, uh, one of the folks that I work with at Sequoia is a guy named James Buckhouse, uh, and James is a is a master storyteller. Literally, uh, I think before this, he was in Hollywood for a while and, and worked on uh, on how to Hollywood film. And uh, one of the programs that James helps to run at Sequoia is something called the Company Design Program, uh, and it's it's actually it's largely focused on, as you put it, this sort of like the day negative one teams or companies. And I think one of the points, uh, you know, there are a lot of topics that James frames through the lens of stories and. Uh, I, I think it's a, it's a really it's a really interesting viewpoint, um, and so one of the exercises that we encourage founders to do, usually again when it's like one or two people, it's it's the very beginning, is like is to sit down and actually write the story of the company, and write the story of the company from like a th few lenses. Like if you think about the job of a founder. Um, like a lot of their job is fundamentally storytelling. Like you're telling a story to customers uh, and that's like what customers are buying into. You're telling a story to investors and that's what investors are investing into. And you're telling a story to employees about why they should come and take the risk to come work there and sort of help build out the company. And I, I think it can be, you know, if you aren't thoughtful and intentional about it, it, it can be kind of random, uh, maybe to, to John's point earlier, it's like, we're, we're doing some interesting stuff, we're building this, or you know, if, if you're not good at talking to customers, maybe you're coming back with like a description of all, like customers don't care what your product does, customers care about how your product is going to make their life better, how your product is gonna make their company better, et cetera. So I think it's a the exercise of understanding and writing down the story of your company specifically for the audiences that matters for your for your teammates for your customers for everyone around the table i think is super important and if you think about the story for teammates if you think about the story for people that want to join the culture that join the company i think a lot of that comes down to being explicit about culture but probably less in a like here is a bunch of bullet uh bullet points or you know things to put on posters and more like why should you come work here? Um, and I think that's, uh, uh, at least for the founders that have gone through the program, and I think I've had to sit down and think about that, I think that has been a, uh, an incredibly valuable exercise. Um, and, and then there's 
there, there are many, many, many people in the world that are smarter about codifying culture than I am. But I, I think uh, having to sit down and write that and have things that have actual teeth, things that are opinionated and pointed and not just platitudes, uh, I think it's an incredibly valuable exercise. And I think it is valuable to start at the beginning, just thinking about what kind of, you know, for the people who join your company, uh, what story do you want to tell them and what story do they want to experience? So. Damn. So, oh, so much there. So we, we talked a little bit about, you know, diversity. We, we kind of came out of your own experiences and, and, and talked about why you joined the cannabis board and, and why you choose to still be a part of this journey. Um, we went a little bit into kind of your portfolio and some of the other boards that you sit on and some of the trends that you're seeing, which I think are positive. And I think um, we don't hear enough stories of founders, right? Who are prioritizing this early, not only the diversity of the organization, but also its culture. And we need to tell more of those stories. Um, and I wanted to kind of come up a little bit, you know, as we wrap around the conversation and really talk about just board service in general. I think it's something that we don't always talk about. Um, there have been a number of articles in probably the past, uh, I would say two years or so, that uh, that sit in two camps. There's one camp that says, well, you know, boards who are leading some of the world's best companies are just not diverse enough, right? And on the other camp, you have folks who come from diverse experiences and backgrounds who say, actually, don't just choose me because I'm a brother, right? Don't tokenize my experience. Choose me because I'm the best person to sit on this board and I just happen to be a brother. And so, um, and yet the board service and like who sits on boards and what folks do is just, it's still so mysterious to so many folks, right? So what I first want to start off is, like, what is the role of a board uh, at this stage and size of Canvas, right? We're about 70 employees. We'll grow to 80 employees by the end of the year. We're trucking along. By the time folks listen to this, we would have executed a rebrand. What is the role of board members kind of in this moment, um, in, in, in our inflection point, knowing that it changes, you know, later down the line a bit? Um, I, yeah, I can, I can take a crack at it. Um... There is a, uh, well, so first let me preface by saying there is a legal definition of a board and a set of things that they are supposed to do, which I, I will come back to at the end. Uh, and is, uh, um, uh, but I, I think substantively, or the way at least I think about boards, or boards are effectively like the closest set of advisors that you can have, uh, have in a company. Um, I think they, well, generally I encourage founders to think about when you are adding someone to the board, um, you should think about it as a hiring decision. You should think about this as hiring another exec into the company. And you should think about that person in terms of both their individual skill set, but as importantly, if not more importantly, how they complement the rest of the people around the table. Um, I think, you know, if you think about, uh, if you think about like the closest set of advisors you have in a company, you don't want uh, you don't want a, just a bunch of sales leaders because uh, you'll have a, an incredible amount of sales advice. Your VP sales will probably be frustrated, um, but you won't, you, you'll be missing a whole bunch of other perspectives. You'll be missing the product and perspective, the engineering perspective, the finance perspective, et cetera. And so I think as you assemble a board, what you really, again, the mental model should be, this is the, this is the inner sanctum, the closest set of advisors you can have to help build a great company. And you want, I think, um, as much diversity on as many, you want the smallest group with the maximal amount of diversity on many dimensions, on backgrounds, but on skill sets, on life experiences, on work experiences, uh, and the like. Um, so that's that's at least how um, that's a little bit how I think about it, and it's definitely like as you know, as the founders that I work with um, as they think about expanding the board as they think about either bringing on new investors or they think about bringing on um, uh, sort of independent board members to help uh, uh, help scale the company. I think the most operative question 99% uh, of the time is like, what does this person bring to the table and how does it sort of complement everything else that is around the table? Sure. JJ. Yeah, I totally agree with all that perspective. Um, I guess to add just a little bit of detail in terms of what a board does, it's the governance structure of a company and it exists to make some of the most impactful decisions a company can make. 
uh, both to advise on them and, and to help the team understand what the consequences might be of taking particular actions, and then also to approve or disapprove of specific decisions like, are we going to sell the company? Are we going to buy another company? Are we going to launch a new branch of the business, et cetera? And I think that you know that's, that's a worthwhile way of thinking about it is that for key decisions that are probably going to have some of the more serious consequences for the company, this is the set of people that ideally you're trusting to make those decisions. So, mm-hmm. you know, that's, that's kind of what the board does. I hope that's helpful. It is. So within the context of diversity, we just had a discussion at the portfolio level about um, how founders are prioritizing this and thinking about this. And in many ways, it's probably the easiest to see, right? I mean, we see the founding team, we get to see how the team grows, people get excited on LinkedIn. Uh, we were excited to, you know, I, I think I was still here when we were uh, announcing your, you joining the, the board, John, and it was a great experience. Um, but we don't see a lot of those announcements, to be honest, unless they're really high profile. And so um, within the context of diversity, do you think it's no secret that board diversity across the board just needs to change? Do we see the same progress in, in board diversity efforts as we are seeing in company diversity efforts? Or do we think that board diversity is kind of a little bit behind the curve? What are your thoughts, either of you? It's challenging. And, you know, to be honest, uh, the data suggests that it's a little bit slower to make progress. And it also suggests the reasons why that's the case. Let me start by kind of framing this as to why I think it's important. And, you know, I answered the prior question because I figured it would be turning in this direction in the conversation. So I wanted to set myself up. But I think, you know, these, this group of people is going to make very consequential decisions about the company. You want those people to have an informed, broad set of perspectives, you know, especially for companies that are focused on taking a large market that includes a lot of different kinds of customers, a lot of different kinds of people interacting with that business. You want to understand the perspective that different people are going to have about your business and make decisions accordingly. So it is important, I think, to have that kind of diversity on the board. In terms of progress, it's again, it's one of these areas where I think people have set the value a little bit more than they've come up with a strategy and been able to execute on that strategy. The reason is, you know, frequently board members are on the more senior end of professionals in that industry. And if you look at the data, as I have, you know, for a number of companies, and there's plenty of public data about this, we've seen more progress on diversity at kind of entry level positions or maybe a rung above that. And it takes time, I think, to develop that talent into those follow on rungs, into the higher rungs at a company. By the time someone's kind of board ready, you know, they they need to have moved up through several rungs uh, in a large corporation or had some other really interesting experience. And so I think our recent efforts towards diversity kind of throughout uh, the economy You've started to see those triple trickle up in a way. They sure. haven't really uh, gotten to equality at the highest levels inside companies. And I think that's sure. part of what it's is kind of holding it back at the board level too. I mean, there was, um, there was some recent, maybe not that recent, a year ago or more, there's some reports about uh, you know, women and, and certain minorities who were board ready just being kind of overwhelmed with board requests. And you know, you just got this sentiment that there aren't enough of these people that are being reached out to about these positions. And you know, we we need to try harder and harder to keep developing more strong leadership across a broader swath of people, which is you know obviously what we're here and what we're talking about. Um, but I think that that's I think there's a delay effect. That's not a it's not an acceptable answer, but I think that's uh, the explanation. I love that answer. Um... And I backed it up. I mean, I think that in many ways we found that in the Genesis story of Jumpstart, right? That we knew against the backdrop of folks going to top 21 schools, but also, I mean, frankly, having as a former DNI leader, I knew that a lot of our leadership uh, at the companies that I've worked for felt a lot more comfortable investing in the future of work, building diverse internship classes, getting folks entry level roles. Uh, for one reason, because we could track graduation rates. And so we could set different targets that you spoke of, Mike, uh, excuse me, John. Um, 
But also uh, there was this feeling that there was a lot more talent out there, right? That reflected different uh, backgrounds and experiences at the more junior levels and the more senior levels. And that wasn't to say that we couldn't hold the same truth, that there were folks who were career ready, but were overlooked for opportunity. But frankly, that's where a lot of organizations turn their attention. So I appreciate that point of view. What about you, Mike? I just want to add to that. Oh, no, go ahead, Jay. You know, as, as you mentioned, Tark, I, I think that it is definitely both. I think that you know, people need to make harder efforts at the board level. I think that there is, again, this explanation of what's happening, not necessarily an acceptable answer. I don't think that we should just rest on our laurels and be happy with that. I think there's definitely more that can be done. But as near as I can tell, you know, you asked, is there as much progress there? And there isn't. And I think that's part of why. I think that's spot on. Are you uh, feeling the same way, Mike? Um, yeah, I would say like I, the there are lots of different uh, there are lots of different there are boards for lots of different types of companies in the world. There are private companies, or you know, almost public companies. There are companies that have been public for a very long time. Um, the the set of boards into which I have visibility tend to be either startups or companies that are about to go uh, about to go public. What I will say is, um, I think to John's point, the, there is an intense interest, at least of the, the companies that I have seen going public, to have, as, um, to, to have a broad and diverse uh, board. Um, and that, that is, uh, I think, an, like a very strong focus of the founders, um, at least, in the, again, in the companies that I've seen. Uh, I also agree that it's... it's um, the, many of the most prominent people, I think, are constantly being hit up uh, uh, for for board seats as a result. Uh, but I do think, at least of the founders that uh, the sample size that I see of the founders that I see, especially for late stage, as you're thinking about going public, this is like a very top of mind issue. Um, uh, and so I, I think that is changing, which is great. I also think there are uh, just an increasing number of organizations that are. Uh, you know, if you think about that as kind of the demand side, I think there's also an increasing number of organizations um, focused on the supply side and just highlighting people that um, have the experience to be great board members or helping, you know, give them the the little extra boost that they need to have the experience to be great board members. Um, um, I, there's a this person I know named Jocelyn. She founded a, a, an organization, I think, called Him For Her. Uh, which is really focused on sort of finding great uh, women leaders and sort of raising their visibility for a board, uh, uh, sort of for, for board memberships. Um, and I think there are similar organizations as well. So I do think, I, I think it is top of mind for a lot of people. Um, and so I feel like you know, there's clearly a tremendous amount of room to grow. Uh, and, you know, we're nowhere near where we need to be. But I do think it is increasingly a top of mind issue for people, which I think is, you know, an encouraging start. It's a really good insight. It is encouraging. Mike. Yeah, if I could just add a little bit to that, I think it's interesting to point out that you know, there has been a lot of progress. That progress might not be evenly distributed. And I think one of mm. the, one of the reasons is very early on in a company's life, you know, the people who are on the board are the founders and maybe an investor or two, and you know, there are okay. some. Kind of inequities in VC allocation and and who VCs are that have taken some time to change. And, you know, there's definitely been some good progress there too. But it's you know another input that makes it a little bit challenging to have a really representative board, especially at the early stages. And I think as the company yeah. grows, as Mike pointed out, it can be easier to address some of those challenges. That's right. Ooh, so it's been it's been a great you know damn near hour chatting with you folks and getting to get to know you more. And I'm excited that our listeners came to know you more. Uh, and now I want to talk about the future as we end our time. Um, so uh, for folks who will be listening to this podcast, you already hear this phrase, this positioning statement. But one of them that we have internally with Canvas now is the future looks like you. And to candidates, we let them know that the future looks like them for so many reasons that uh, that they're not just where they've worked or what they've done, but that they're the sum of their experiences, right? That the country is becoming grownly more diverse and that different levels of diversity are becoming that much more valuable, not only for communities, but for companies as a whole. And for recruiters and talent leaders and, and D&I leaders, et cetera, uh, we tell them that the future looks like them, that one recruiter, one sourcer, right? 
can really make an impact on someone's experience. Less is around as a, a gatekeeper, but a door opener in so many ways. And we're seeing that progress. Uh, and so after every episode, um, we, we ask folks to kind of look into the future a little bit. And we ask them to share with the world. It could be candidates. It, it could be recruiters. It could be portfolio companies. It could be founders. It could be other board members. Whatever audience you want to speak to. Um, in the spirit of Canvas, since you folks have helped us get here, tell us why uh, the future looks like one of those populations, why the future looks like them. Uh, and any of you can start. And, uh, and yeah, we'll take it from there. Uh, well, I can jump in and I, I'll try to bring it full circle. You know, we started out saying that there's been more progress recently. And I think that that's something to be really proud of in our industry of, you know, bringing in a larger, diverse set of folks uh, into the fold in, in technology and other industries and making sure that those people feel included. They feel like they belong there. And I think that we're only going to see more. I think we're in the early days of building out the kind of generalizable strategy about how to do this stuff. You know, we right. started out with, with vision. We started out with values and goals. And we're starting to get to the point where we have not just a set of tools, but also kind of an, a set of, of knowledge, understandings of how to do particular things. I actually want to throw in one concrete example. That's really not a piece of technology, but you know, a company I talked to recently was focused on this problem. Decided to uh, include a, a new innovation in the interview experience, and this was before COVID. So people were coming into the office; they were eating lunch there, usually kind of chaperoned by someone at the company, and they started allowing candidates to choose who at the company they wanted to eat lunch with. And it was an mm. opportunity for them to pick a person that they identify with and to have a casual conversation about, hey, what's it like here for someone like me? Which is, I think, an mm -hmm. incredibly powerful kind of thing to do for someone to give them that kind of insight. And I say that because you know, that's the kind of thing that I think we need to be doing more of. And as we work our way down this path where you know, we're building out the tools that allow us to set goals intelligently, to build out strategies, to start executing them. Part of it is also just walking the path and figuring out what works more and more. And we're doing that in so many different ways. I'm, I'm really proud of our industry for innovating that way, not just in, in the technology again, but in the process and in the knowledge of how to do this and, and what it takes. That's right. Mike. Um. There were uh, there were a lot of different audiences uh, you said that that one could speak to, uh, and one uh, one audience that popped to mind for me was recruiters. Um, I just I, um, I I'm sure uh, I'm sure all of us feel this way, and many other people feel this way. But there have been various points in my life where uh, I, I sort of would not be where I am today had it not been for someone believing in me. Whether it was I remember like my college interview a long time ago at this point, 22, 23 years ago, uh, where I, I, I could tell the person just sort of uh, um, believed in me. Uh, and I think that probably helped. And, and my college recruiter, actually, one of the reasons I was so excited by Jumpstart at the, the beginning is uh, I think my college recruiter had a huge impact on my life and my career and where I ended up. Uh, I'm still friends with her today. Uh, like uh, we, we still meet up every so often. Uh, and so uh, I think the that sort of act of believing in someone else and being their advocate and sort of helping them get over that hurdle and, and inject the confidence that they need to know that they can do it can be it can be incredibly powerful. Whether it is a whether it is a college recruiter, wh whether it is literally a the college recruiter I was talking about was the person who helped get me into college. But uh, whether it's you know that person, whether it is uh, uh, a recruiter working at a company, whether it's a first manager, and so I think that uh, I think believing in people and giving them the confidence uh, to know that they can do it uh, can be incredibly powerful. So um, that's the I think just keep doing that. Mm. Mike, John, the future looks like you. Uh, thank you for spending the last hour with us, with our listeners. Um, I think that you've made the idea of board service approachable and accessible, but also really, you know, gave us to it, some insight into folks um, who are well connected in our industry in terms of the progress that we're making um, in some areas and in other areas where we need more growth. 
I think what I take away from this, and I think our listeners will as well, is that uh, we're just getting started in this DNI work, right? And in some, some years prior, it almost felt like it was finished, right? That we were actually going in the opposite direction. And I felt this personally, even in my role, um, both of my roles prior to, prior to Canvas. Um, but I have some hope and I have some confidence, especially after the last year, a year that was really tough for a lot of communities. The silver lining for me was that uh, what, what, what felt like the opportunity landscape closing was actually the opportunity landscape widening. Um, and so with that, uh, appreciate you, appreciate you uh, being with our listeners and uh, we can't wait to share it with the world. So thank you, gentlemen. Thank you. It's great to talk to you. Thank guys. you, Aaron.